Uh, thanks so much for having me today. And uh, rank half this privilege because I am exercising the warm weather guitar. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to dive right in here. Uh, here's my little shop, the John Stevens shop in Newport, Rhode Island. It's a funny little place that you would probably drive right by where you would give it a second look. And what we do, for all intents and purposes, is we take a broad edge brush and paint, and we paint lettering on paper, uh, and then we take a mallet and chisel, and we carve that lettering into stone. Uh, and the really big question in all of this is, uh, so, initially though, so, so we'll do small commissions. This is a single character that was for an architectural firm down in Philadelphia, or we'll do thousands and thousands of characters. This is the Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, D.C. And we carved all of those inscriptions in design. Uh, but the big question is why? Why do this? Why pack away with mallets and chisels in, in this day and age uh, when we have this really incredible machine? You know, with the, with the computer, there, there are thousands of typefaces that you can grab and uh, apply, and you can connect this machine to a uh, diamond grinding machines or a mechanical etching machines. Why would I put myself through the hassle of carving these things by hand and drawing all this letter by hand? And the reason is because of this dapper you know, dude right here. This is my grandfather, John Howard Benson. And uh, back in the very early 20s, late teens, he was an artist in New York City. He went to the Art Students League. And uh, he painted there. He was a printmaker. He had really, really great graphic sensibilities. And when he was done with his education in New York City, he didn't really know what he was going to do. He got married, and he was facing the realities of bringing up a family, the, the financial realities of that. And he found a little John Stevens shop. Uh, he knew about it, but he thought, oh, you know, I could, I could probably buy that place. It was the last generation of the Stevens family who were running it. There were six generations of that family who ran it for, since 1705 all the way up until 1926. So my grandfather went in there, and it was kind of at that point a little bit more like a men's club. The old dudes were hanging out and drinking in there, and it's okay. It was, uh, that was the scene. And my grandfather thought, hey, you know, this is a really beautiful little studio. I could, I could, I could probably buy this place and, and keep this going. Uh, and he had always been really, really interested in the old colonial gravestones, which are right up the street in the big common burying ground in Newport. Uh, the other thing uh, about those stones is that when most people look at them, they think of them as sort of very naive, cookie cutter pieces of work that are from a bygone era and that they're, they're, they really don't have any artistic merit. Um, my grandfather saw them in a very, very different way. He understood that they were really, really interesting, although somewhat naive, but, but quite sophisticated pieces of unified design. Um, he understood also that these things were all being executed and designed at the same time, and that helped the artistic integrity of these things. Uh, he got really, really into the lettering, too. And the interesting thing about this lettering that those guys did back then is that they didn't have any printed examples to look at. It's not like they could run out and uh, you know, pick up a laptop and check out what type of typefaces would influence these things. They were making these letter forms up for all intents and purposes. So the actual physical action of carving these letters into stone had a lot to do with the way in which they were made. Now, the whole time, my, my father was sort of contemplating all of this and how he was then going to try and make some of this stuff of, of his own. Uh, the world was going in a completely different direction. It was heading toward modernity. And here's a production line in the 1920s of uh, the Ford Motor Company. Uh, it was all about getting away from the handmade object and the mechanical perfection of the modern age, perhaps the most ideally uh, seen in the, the work of the Bauhaus, which is in Germany. Uh, even typefaces that were typically hand-cut, those dies were hand-cut, became mechanically produced, um, so much so that, that the, the absolute perfection of the mechanical form took over entirely. So when you look at this piece of type, this is uh, Futura, the typeface Futura, every single day, every single day, every single season, exactly the same. They're mechanically perfect in that way. Uh, the typeface Futura that Paul Renner designed is pretty much the 
entire opposite of a calligraphic form. It is looks as though it was really made with a machine. Uh, and it's a, actually a really wonderful typeface, and its popularity is, in, is, is, is obvious today, right? <laughs> so, so, so back to the end of the, of the 18th century, uh, the, the sort of monument trade and in, uh, the inscriptions were, were really starting to be affected by this typographic standard that I'm talking about with the margin. So this guy, John Baskerville, some of you who might be into fonts and know a little bit about lettering have heard of the Baskerville typeface. Well, this guy, John Baskerville, was a really, really amazing calligrapher. And he did absolutely gorgeous work. And also, he was a stone carver, and he did beautiful, beautiful work. But if you see the words cut in any of the hands, that is based on uh, typefaces that he was starting to design. And so this was then making a real turn in terms of the way in which letters were, were being uh, designed in carbon. So here's a gravestone that is looking a lot more like a piece of printed work, almost like a title page, or like a broadside. Um, it's getting away from all of that, that really sort of humanistic individual quality that we saw in the early colonial stones. And it, and it began to, 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 to be even more almost cartoonishly typographic. Um, this one is really crazy because what happened in, in the industry at this point is that or the ornamental work became very, very naturalistic. So you can see this really cool piece of ivy, which is beautifully carved, but then the letters look like they are made out of lead or something. And, and the irony is, is that those are actually carved by hand to make it look as though they were machine produced. How screwy is that? So then, to, to push matters even further into the mechanical and modern process, along came a process called sandblasting where you take a rubber mat, and you put the rubber mat up against the stone, you carve out a letter in the rubber, you pull out the rubber, and then you blast sand at the exposed stone, and it etches into the stone and creates a letter form. Here's a hand-cut, V-cut R on the left, and there's a sandblasted R on the right. And it looks like that on the right. <laughs> So this was the current state of the monument trade when my grandfather was contemplating all of this sort of artistic approach to it. I mean, pretty horrendously ugly. Not to be too judgmental, or anything, I'm just saying. So my grandfather was like, you know, I'm going to throw all of that modern stuff right out the window. I'm going to take all of the artistic knowledge that I uh, gleaned uh, and apply it to this idea of making one-of-a-kind memorials. So here's an early stone that he did that is sort of along the lines of the, the basic layout used in the colonial stones, but he's not just doing some sort of uh, variation of the colonial thing. This is really much more of a contemporary piece. The ornamental work has a lot more to do with the Beaux-Arts. It's a centered piece of text, although it's like calligraphically made. It's, it looks a lot more like a sort of typographic text. So he was not about sort of making the old shopping where you come into our shop and put on a tricorn hat and eat rock candy and crap like So here's another stone that he did relatively early on. And this is not at all connected to the older stones. He, he, he made a shape that he thought was, was contemporary. A carefully drawn characters. And uh, really it's, it's a very effective piece. And it has that humanistic side that I, I mentioned that the colonial stones have so, so much of. Now, he was a pretty academic guy, and so he started to study the origins of lettering, which led him to Rome. And the interesting thing about these amazingly beautiful Roman characters, which we take so much for granted, is that uh, these are 2,000 years old, by the way. They were brushed with a broad edge brush, the, the same tool that we use today. Here's a really big inscription down in Rome, not only Appian Way. And my grandfather was looking very closely at these things. And what he decided to do, like the colonial stones, he decided to take the process, but apply it in a contemporary way. He didn't want to just ape these classical versions. He also studied a Carolingian minuscule, which was the beginning of lowercase lettering as we understand it today. This is a 9th century piece of Carolingian minuscule. And he looked very closely at italic. This is chancery italic from the 16th century. And he kind of took all these historic things and he applied them in his own way. So here you see the Roman cap is on the top, 
the sort of delusion, the very Carolingian minuscule, uh, lowercase inspired on the bottom, and then the italic, the very bottom there. And the thing about this alphabet stone that my, my grandfather did is it has a lot of the sort of same artistic integrity that those colonial stones had. It's a really beautiful piece of work. Here's a gravestone that he did over here that's in, in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And it's really interesting because it sort of has connections to the Roman inscriptions, but it also has sort of a, a, a colonial quality to it. But it is most certainly not either one of those areas. Here's a really beautiful tablet that he did at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which was, uh, again, when, when you look at bits and pieces of this, you notice that, that there's some inconsistencies and some oddities that you look at and just think, wow, he kind of got that wrong. But you have to look at the, old, the whole thing as a, as, as a single piece of work. And it has much, much more to do with that, that, that aspect of the human. So my grandfather died in 1956, and my father took over the business in 1960. Uh, now, my dad didn't want to sort of just copy my grandfather's work. He wanted to, to sort of make a, a specific statement of his own in terms of, of developing the, the work in the shop. So he was looking at type designers of the era who were calligraphers who decided to put a lot more of that humanity I mentioned back into, into type-based design. So this is uh, a work by I mean, Rudolf Kahl, which had a lot of pizzazz to it. My dad loved this guy's work. Uh, this is some absolutely beautiful typeface design by a very famous calligrapher named Hermann Zoff, and he was a huge influence on my dad. So here's an alphabet stone my dad made. And the interesting thing about this is that it doesn't have quite as much of the quirky quality that my grandfather's stuff has. It has much more of the sort of precise finish of the typographic letter. And uh, everybody really, really loved my dad's work. He, he became quite well known nationally and internationally. Here's a piece of a tablet lettering that he did, uh, that he, he painted and then carved and gilded. And this thing is one of the most beautiful inscriptions I've ever seen. It's just really, really stunning. So here he is down at the Kennedy Memorial in Arlington Cemetery in DC, uh, working on the central inscriptions. And he's 23 years younger than I am in this photo. Oh, that's brutal. So what happened was all of a sudden the computer came on in the 80s, and all of my dad's colleagues were like, dude, you're toast, you're done. The computer's going to kill you. And he said, no, 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 this is a tool. I can use this tool. And what he did is this just happened to come around. The, the, the actual use of the computer as a type designing tool came around when the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C. was starting to come together. And my dad saw an opportunity here to use that tool and combine both calligraphic forms and typographic forms in a really interesting way. So he designed a site-specific typeface for the FDR Memorial, which he combined with calligraphic hand cut letters. So these were letters that he actually physically painted on this really, really rough surface. He hand carved these. And then in these blocks, he sandblasted with his own specific typeface these large bodies of text. And the combination of the two is a really, really great combo. So here's me as a punk kid <laughs> in the backyard at the shop. I, I was saying, like, I'm taking it in by osmosis and just sucking it in. But in the, in the background there, you see samples from the Kennedy Memorial that were, that were up on the side of the, the shop back then. So I, uh, I started when I was 15, and my dad uh, was very, very interested in me getting up to speed as a carver really quickly because he wanted to make money on me, you know? And uh, I produce work that oftentimes is a lot like my grandfather's. It has a lot of the same sort of uh, really very, very sort of visceral, graphic quality that my grandfather's has. But then sometimes I make stuff that looks a lot like my dad's. Um, I don't quite know where my voice is. My father says that I have to have very, very much my own, and it's well established, but I can't be objective about it. I can't really see it. Uh, but like my dad, I got involved in a bunch of these big memorials. This is a World War II memorial down in D.C. This fellow that I'm talking to is a project manager who was the quintessential Southern gentleman who was running the entire job. And I'm asking him about my compressor over this morning. He's looking at me like, Bud, if you put your compressor there, I'm not going to get your book. <laughs> that's, 
kind of the guy he was. Really, really good guy. So if you see there up at the Atlantic, and then there are quotes down in the lower walls, and then I don't know if any of you have been to the World War II alarm, but like my dad, I decided to design a site-specific typeface for that in the morning. So what was interesting about this is that uh, rather than using a typeface, which is ideally designed for print, black and white page, for two-dimensional application, what I do is I design these letters understanding that they're going to look a very, very different way once they're carved in stone. So I made really, really conscious decisions about how I was going to weight these things and how the distribution of thick and thin would look because I knew how they were ideally going to look when they were cut stone. So here's the typeface that I used for that memorial. And if you guys go down there and check it out, you can see just how that all turned out. Here is a really, really interesting memorial in New York City on Roosevelt Island. It's the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Four Freedoms Park Memorial. And this is designed by a postmodern architect named Louis Kahn. He's a very, very famous architect of the 20th century. Um, he designed the thing in 1972, and uh, it was going to be built, but, but as New York was moving along in 1975, the whole city of New York went bankrupt. And so this whole project just completely died. And uh, the, the architect, Louis Kahn, uh, was, was well known for the fact that he died in a men's room the Port Authority from a heart attack. And he was sort of all alone, and it was this really sad story. And he was actually clutching the plans to this memorial in his, in his hands like that. Pretty upsetting. So back in the early aughts, uh, I forget what it was, maybe 2002, 2003, a bunch of uh, New York City folks decided, okay, it's time to build Louis Kahn's Freedom for Freedom's Park. So here's uh, a view looking down the length of the park. There's the UN across the uh, river there. And then here's a vista looking down along the length of one of the walkways. Kahn was a postmodernist. It was all very, very simple lines, and he was playing on this idea of the horizon line, and then he had these tall pieces of granite that were meant to, to echo the, the skyline. And that block that's sort of in the center of the page here is where we had the central inscription we had cut. So here's the typeface that I designed for that one morning. And what's interesting about this is that it's, it's sort of a modernist letter. So it's a lot like Futura in the fact that it's a sans serif character and it is not that evident that I drew these things initially by hand. There's an ever, ever, ever so slight sweep to the stroke that suggests that, I, that there's a calligraphic sign to it, but it's written there, so. So here's the overall inscription that I designed, and I made a point of, of making really broad line spacing here so that it's sort of carrying on this idea of the horizon line, and then it's on this big, beautiful block of granite. So, so that photo's not so great, but you can get a sense of us carving there. So here's the finished inscription. Uh, it turned out really, really nice though. And if you guys get down to New York City and you get a chance to go over to Roosevelt Island, you should really check it out. It's a great one. So I continue on doing uh, work that's a lot like the, the, the stuff that my grandfather and my father did. I'll, I'll make great stones and dedicatory tablets and things like that. And here's a really great shot of Martin Luther King Memorial at night. And I'll continue to, to, to do this stuff. But this machine is really sort of throw me a curveball. Because what's happening now is we are experiencing life through the digital realm more and more. Whether it's gaming or whether it's just you know us passing on phones or if we're designing the computer, we tend to be looking through the filter of the digital world without working directly with the analog world. And it's a strange thing. So a few years back, I received a really big grant. It's called uh, MacArthur Fellowship. And basically what happens with MacArthur Fellowship is that you, you can't apply for this thing. You get a phone call, you get the phone and they say, are you sitting down? They literally say, are you sitting down? And we say, well, why? They say, sit down. Uh, you have just won MacArthur Fellowship. And what that is, they give you $500,000 with no strings attached whatsoever. And they just say, hey, you're great. Do whatever you want. And that is absolutely unprecedented in terms of grants, because typically there are all sorts of conditions um, attached to, to grants of that size. So 
Uh, and they give these things to people that they, they feel will, will do justice to the, to the idea of the grin. And when I received it, I was so blown away, and I thought, okay, there's a definite obligation here for me to do something with this grin. And one of the things that really allows you to do is navel gaze. You just like hang out, think a little bit, pay some bills so that you don't feel the need to just constantly work and pay bills. And for me, what I ended up doing is I sort of took this crazy left hand turn into making art. And now I'm going to subject you guys to looking at that art. Sorry, that's the way that's going to go. So, you know, I started thinking about the fact that you know, I'm, I'm in my tiny little shop, I can with Alice and Chisels, but the world really is all about the machine. So here's a production line, completely unlike the photograph of the, of the auto, automobile production line you saw before, in that there's not a human being in this photo. You know, all, the, the only human, human interaction is programming, and then coming in and doing some maintenance every now and then, and calibrating the machine. But there is no human aspect here. How about this dude? Like, it's a big milling machine. He's got a camera. He walks away, and this milling machine makes this incredible object out of a giant block of aluminum. I mean, even Joe Schmo Carpenter, dude, has got the shop bot. Look at that shop bot right there. And it's just like, you know, some carpenter. Uh, the, the, the connection to the computer realm is just complete right now. Here's digital renderings of uh, a hotel. This really, really speaks to the fact that we, we, we make all of these, these environments in the digital realm. And these people who are designing these things are never looking at anything. We're looking at mock-ups that are, that are physically made of anything. You know, this goes all the way down to residential uh, designs. You know, that's, a, that's a CGI rendering. I'm sorry, this is kind of like you know, kicking you guys in the stomach, but I've got to show this photo. Uh, so here is the Rice Museum in Holland. And that painting, The Night Watch by Rembrandt, is one of the most famous paintings in the world. It's an absolutely stunning thing. And what are the youth doing? It's all about you know, Snapchat. Look at this photo of Gerta. You know, and the like nobody's looking at him. So I, I'm, I'm kind of stuck with you guys now a little bit. And I know you're all not like that. But. So my little shop is kind of like, I mean, I, basically, let's face it, I'm a caveman. You know, here's my little cave, and I'm definitely like a little mountain chisel. But I was on my computer uh, a few years back. And I was typing away, and you know, something, the machine glitched out, and all of a sudden this piece of text jumped up on the page. And I was like, what the hell is this? What is this? And I immediately understood that it was, you know, the computer glitched out and some piece of code. But I stopped and looked at it for a second and I said, man, that's, that's a really, really interesting body of text. You know, I spent my entire life looking at bodies of text and designing bodies of text. So I saw this thing and I said, man, that's got some aesthetic appeal. It's really interesting. So I started running certain phrases and various things through computer encoding programs. So this is a piece of Roman brush lettering, exactly like the Romans brushed it back then, but that's a piece of base 64 encryption. So a client of mine wanted to commission a piece of work for me. They wanted an alphabet stone, and I said, I said, yeah, I can do that, but I'm, I'm making this new work, and you might, you might be into it. He said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So I painted this up, and you to look at it so much that I carved it and gilded it and slayed it. So what's interesting about this kind of stuff is that what I'm doing is I'm making symbolic pieces that are taking ephemeral pieces of code, code that doesn't last at all. It's in, last, some, in some cases, it lasts for a nanosecond. And I'm carving them in stone in perpetuity that will last forever. Right? Or, you know, kind of crazy. Kind of crazy. So here's another piece that I did where I took the physical alphabet itself, A through Z, and I ran it through base 64 encoding. And then I did this really wacky, crazy, loose calligraphic form and put it on a stone and carved it. Um, now, a lot of what goes into this too is that I was, I was really, really influenced by uh, urban calligraphic forms, textile, graffiti, things like that. But what's interesting about having about 30 years worth of experience 
making forms very, very precisely in a very, very organized way is that your body gets used to making specific lettering. So when you want to cut loose and do some crazy, wacky stuff, you cannot help but reproduce some of the characters that you've been, you've been making your entire life. So the flavor of that is injected into these really loose pieces. So it's a very, very interesting dynamic uh, a piece of calligraphic form. And then when I carved the thing, I'm really, really maniacal about getting a tight cut because I want it to look as loose and free and sweepy. It looks as though this, this, this thing was cut out of water. It's wicked hard. Come on down to the shop, grab a mountain, and you'll have a go at it and you're going to go it's, it's nice. It's really rough. I'm sorry, this, this photo isn't so great, but uh, this is a, an initial sketch that I did of a big body of text that is a PGP code. So at one point, Edward Snowden went on a jag about NSA being able to read our emails with impunity because they can hack anything. So Snowden said, well, you know what? If you use a PGP code to encrypt your emails, NSA can't read anything. So he put this email out to the general public. It's like, use this PGP code. And I thought, man, that is an ultimate, I don't know what's, what's, what's a better representation of the information age than that piece of text. So, I worked up a really big version of it. I, I, I drew this with a, with a pen, with, with a uh, magic marker, in like seven minutes. Really, really quick. And then I, I did an outline drawing over these characters so that I could transfer them onto the stone. And here I am in the process of carving. It's probably going to take me a year to carve all that stuff. It's really, really, really involved. So I don't really know where all of this is going to go. So I'm, I'm going down this route of, of fine art, but I'm definitely continuing on in the tradition that I inherited and doing all of the other work. And uh, that's pretty much my life in a nutshell. Thanks, guys. You know, I went to art school, and so I always had this sort of artistic bent. You know, it, you know it's in the genes. So I, I, I would have been doing some sort of art, I think. I just don't know. I, I, I did go to art school, so I, I was heading in that direction anyway. But my old man sucked me. You know, it's funny that I, certain things really appeal to me, and so they can be. Uh, the, the work is relatively broad in terms of like there are certain gravestones that I really, really like. And then there are other architectural inscriptions that I really, really dig. There's stuff on my father's, my grandfather's. And my stuff, I'm, the problem with being like a crazy perfectionist the way I am, and my, my father is definitely this way, is that you see any given piece of work that you've done, and all you can see is, I wish I tweaked it, like I it this way or that way. So you need a few years to get away from that, to be able to then come back and get the objective view to say, oh, no, hey, that's not bad, you know. So, so I don't really have a specific favorite piece. There's some okay ones out there that I did. Do you ever mess up while you're carving? <laughs> That's a good question because oftentimes people envision me with a mountain chisel like on some stone and I'm like, boom, and then the whole thing cracks in half. They're like, oh, what do I do? But that never happens. Or like, oh, I slipped and I popped the whole center out and then, oh, that's, the, the, the fact of the matter is is that when you learn how to do this thing, you spend about, I don't know, about like three years learning how not to make mistakes. That's, that's the skill that you initially learn. And so you take that on, and only once did I feel really nervous carving on a piece. When I was 17, my dad, who had gotten me up to, to being a really good carver at that point, took me down to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. I don't know if you've been there, but it's a really, really intimidating, beautiful place. And he wanted me to carve inscriptions on into the wall of the National Gallery of Art when I was 17. And I got up on the scaffolding and I was like, oh man, if I screw up here, this is really serious. But once I sunk the chisel and I got going, that was fine. But that was a good thing. Yeah. I've done, I've done some, some uh, wood carving and a couple of other um, things, but I'm pretty much doing stone most of the time, I'm getting, dedicating myself to it because there's, there's an awful lot to do there and I'm kept really busy doing it. So, so it's really pretty much all stone. I mean, I do a lot of design work on the computer though. I'm not, I mean, the computer is definitely not my enemy. I love the computer and it's really handy. So I've designed um, logos and things like that.
of God. We can do a fair bit of that. So it's a very, very tight community. The thing is, is that there are really, really great carvers out there, and then there are really, really great graphic designers and calligraphers, but the two often don't mesh. So it's not like you find a bunch of calligrapher type designers who are then stone carvers. What, what typically happens is a graphic designer designs something that's handed off to some stone carving crew, and that's the worst possible combination. Because when you try and apply typographic two-dimensional standards to inscriptional work, it's going to suck. That's the way it does. I mean, my, my opinion. It, the, the, the types of stone really, really differ. And so, you know, you get soft stones that have really fine grain, like, the, like all of this stuff. Um, it's really, really interesting because it's a very, very fine grain slate. It carves beautifully. It can get a really, really tight finish on it. But then you get big green granites, and they don't resolve well at all. And so you have to sort of like beat them into submission, and you have to use a lot of effort with granite because it's a silica-based material. It's basically like carving glass. It's really, really rough. So you gotta like whack on it and be extremely careful. And then on the large architectural jobs, oftentimes we have to use pneumatic hammers, which is like a little jackhammer, and you pop the chisel in the end. You still have to have all of the skill that you use when you're carving by hand. It's just that this piston that drives the chisel moves it really, really quickly. And if there's any opportunity to screw up, it's with that tool. It's super, super dangerous because you move really, really quickly. Uh, and so that's, um, it, it, all of it varies quite a bit. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, the problem that I'm having today in terms of the computer is that um, people don't really understand uh, hand-drawn form the way they used to. Uh, even designers, only like 30 years or so, when they were designing typefaces and stuff, there was a lot of work that was done by hand. And that's gone, and now it's all best acres and, and all, all done uh, in the digital realm. And so, you know, it, it's really, really tricky trying for, for me to now tell people like architects, like, no, man, this has merit because it was done this way. Um, oftentimes, now I'm just dealing with, wow, what's the same as the you know, Rowley version? One's, one has no soul whatsoever, and the other one is all is all human. So, not, not to be too extreme about it, but it is that way. I've never gotten into figurative sculpture, sculpture in the round, where it's like, you know, a lady with a jug, you know, and kind of I never got into any of that, but my dad uh, did a whole bunch of figurative sculpture when he was at the Rodin School of Design, and he got back into it recently. But um, I've done a lot of bodily work, which is low-level uh, carving that you do, which is all very modeled, and I've done portraits of people and things like that, which is a variation, but, but bodily is a very, very, very tricky thing to do, and I'm constantly learning. The other thing is, you know, I'm 30 odd years into it, I learn every, every single day. You, you never stop learning, and you never stop pushing to, to the next level. So what the Murphy Fellowship allowed me to do is take the time off from work to then develop pieces like that. Um, and really, to, to get away and do a little research, I went over to Rome a few years back and did a whole bunch of study on Roman inscriptions that uh, I hadn't seen before. And sort of just, it takes a long time to feed this kind of development. You have to look at a whole bunch of different stuff to really, to get it properly informed. I'm, I'm actually coming up against this because even though I'm extremely well established in my field, I'm at the very top of my field. As a fine artist, I'm nobody, really. I'm, the only thing that gives me some, uh, some weight is, is MacArthur Fellowship. And so I have done um, an arts in residency at the Yale University Art Gallery, and they have one of my pieces in, in the collection, which is great. And I have a couple of other pieces in other, other collections. But I am not a well-established artist, so I personally am coming up against this difficulty of finding my audience and patrons and galleries that, that are even interested in what I'm doing. So you guys are seeing more than most people see. Uh, I'm just starting out, so, so let me know if you get any details on that. Because I'm kind of feel this way. Yeah, yeah, we've done, we've done uh, inscription, Greek inscriptional work. I actually was over in Beijing recently, and I carved some Chinese over there, which was pretty wild. So, and I, and I carved Arabic, and I carved a bunch of different languages and, and different styles of lettering within those languages based on historic forms, which is, uh, which is really cool. I love doing that. It, it just gives you a much, much broader perspective of, of greater international letter form and calligraphy. It's really cool.
I do. The, I have I have two kids. I have my son's fifteen and he's forgot He's an academic. He's not. He's not. He doesn't make things with his hands. But my daughter is the one with all of the, the artistic ability. But she's terminally seventeen right now, and that's gonna take a while to change that. We'll see. It's so funny because people look at a lot of the inscriptions and they say that will last forever. Nothing lasts forever. Nothing. So, so even when I when I carve something down in DC and on one of these big memorials, I'm like, yeah, no, it'll last a while, maybe a couple thousand years. And then at one point, there's a great poem by by a, a poet named Percy Shelley called Ozymandias. I don't know if you guys any of you guys know that poem, but yeah, but basically I, I recite Ozymandias and I basically say, look, nothing lasts forever. I, I, I like to think of myself as a relatively bright guy, and I don't hire fools who like to stick a chisel in their hand and something like that. And injuries are not that popular. As I said, they, they, they love their, they're absolutely enamored with the, with the technical skill of, of machinery. But if you have a machine making something, there is no evidence of the humanity in it. Where, the, 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 the greater question is, where is the humanity in the artifact? So when you look at ancient inscriptions, you can see that a man with a mountain chisel carved this thing. And I, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to be sexist here, but it was probably a dude. So, so that is, is what gives these things so much life. And what is so appealing to us? I mean, we are, we are human beings. And whenever I'm down on any given job, and I'm up on a wall, and I'm hacking away with a mountain chisel, people stop and they're like, like what? what are you doing? You're doing that? That's awesome. They really get into it. Because they're just like, I can't believe somebody's actually physically doing it. There's a certain amount of value in that, in that actual process. And to be able to see that it was handmade. Yes, machines can do anything, but it will, it will be soulless. There is no humanity in it. And that's the, that's the same with typeface design, to a large extent. It's a very important thing to understand.